morning, guys. How are we? Good to, good to see you here as always. I uh, just want to, of course, acknowledge, as was already mentioned, uh, the significance of the day being our one-year anniversary in this building. Hard to believe. I uh, can't believe it's been a year, but we've made it, and uh, glad that you're uh, still with us here. So uh, grab your Bibles. James chapter 3 is going to be our text uh, this morning. We took a break last week for Family Sunday. Had a blast, as always, but we're excited to be back in the book of James. Uh, we're not planning on taking another break, uh, so we'll just be in uh, James from here until uh, November. So uh, James chapter 3 is our text. Uh, so since it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in James, let me just uh, kind of get us caught up once again, just recap what we've been looking at. James, uh, of course, is teaching us how to have genuine living faith. He, he wants our faith to be alive and active, growing and genuine. Uh, in fact, he's said things like, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Faith without works is dead, right? That this is James' whole thing in this letter. His whole point is that our faith would be active and not passive. That our faith would be alive and genuine. That there ultimately should not be a disconnect between our head, our heart, and our hands. Right? Between what we say, what we think, what we believe, and what we do, there should be unity between all of it, right? And so this is James' whole theme of his Letter And so two weeks ago, what we looked at in the first half of James chapter 3 is James warns us of the power of our words, that the words that we say have immense power to either bring blessing or cursing, that our words have the ability to bring life or death, right? And so we are to be careful with what we say because our words have immense power. And so that's what we looked at two weeks ago, and we'll just pick things right up where we left off here in James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Here's what it says. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So, so this is our text for the morning, and what James is dealing with here is the subject of wisdom, that, that we would be wise people. So look again what he says at verse 13. He starts out and says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and the meekness of wisdom. So James asks this question, Who is wise and understanding among you? And then he follows that up with basically the statement, Prove it. Right? If you claim to be wise and understanding, prove it. Right? And again, this is James' whole point of his letter. This is what he's after in every aspect of our lives. Whatever it is that we would prove that we have genuine faith, that we would prove that, that we have wisdom by our works. Right? We have to show our work. So if you remember math class growing up in school, and I know by, by having some of you remember math class, I'm bringing back horror, uh, horrific memories, but, but if you remember math class, one of the things you were always required to do, at least if you had a good teacher, was you had to show your work, right? It wasn't enough just to arrive at an answer. In fact, you couldn't even just arrive at the right answer. You had to show how you got there. Right, so, so on the test, you, you could have the correct answer, but you would be marked off for it if you did not show your work. Right? And, and so in the same way, it, it's not enough just to claim that we have wisdom. What James is saying here is it's not enough just to claim that we have wisdom. It's not enough to claim that we have the right answers. We have to show our work. We have to prove that we have wisdom by the way that we walk, right? So, so James is saying if we claim to have wisdom and understanding, we, it must be evident by the way we live. S simply put, if we claim to have wisdom and understanding, we can't live like morons, right? I mean, this is what James is saying, that, that the way that we live our life, the way that we conduct our life, it must line up with our claim to have wisdom. We need to live as wise people and not 
fools. Now, now the question is, before we move forward, the question is, well, what is wisdom? Well, if you were here week one of this series, which it's been a few weeks now, so I'll, I'll remind us, but if you were here week one, we answered this question because James talks about wisdom in chapter one, right? And, and so what, what is wisdom? Well, wisdom ultimately is having a proper perspective, Wisdom is seeing things as they should be, or better yet, seeing things as God intended them to be. So, so wisdom is seeing things like our marriage, seeing things as God intends marriage to be. Uh, wisdom is seeing things, uh, our money, seeing money and our finances, handling our money as God intended us to handle it. Wisdom is, is seeing every aspect of our life, our job, Right, our relationships, everything is seen through the lens of how God designed and created it to function. This is the wisdom that the Bible talks about. And this is the wisdom that James wants us to walk in. Right? So, so in other words, what, what James is getting after here is that we need to walk and live as God intended us to walk and live. We need to see our life and every aspect of it the way that God sees it. Now, now J- James is going to drop a bombshell here because he's going to tell us that there are actually two different types of wisdom. Right, there is a true wisdom that comes from above, and there is a false wisdom that does not come from above. Right? And, and, and despite the narrative being told by our culture, we know this to be true, that there is a, a, a good way to live and there is a stupid way to live. Right? And the narrative of our culture wants to say, however you choose to live, however you want to live, it's your choice. There are no real consequences. Right? No one can judge you. Right? There is no right or wrong way to live. But we know this to be false. You can make some really stupid decisions that lead you down a, a path of death and destruction. Right? We know this to be true. And then there is a way to live that ultimately will bring life and liberty and flourishing. Right? We, we, we know this to be true, that there is true wisdom and there is a false type of wisdom that can lead us down a path of pain and death. And so James is going to first talk about this false wisdom. So look what he says again, verse 14 through 16. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. So according to James, what he seems to be saying here is that the the root of false wisdom is the belief that I am the center of the universe. And by I am the center of the universe, I don't mean Ryan Clymer is the center of the universe, but every single one of us hold this belief that I am the center of the universe. We all believe it to some varying degree or another, if we were to be honest. right? We all believe this. Right, that, that I am the center of the universe, that everybody revolves around me. Right? Every, every relationship I have, my coworkers, my boss, my marriage, my family, everyone revolves around me. They orbit my planet. Right? That, this is the belief that we all hold. And James seems to be saying that this is the root of this false wisdom. And this root sprouts bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. So, so bitter jealousy is the belief that I deserve that, right? And not just jealousy, but bitter jealousy, like the type of jealousy that makes you bitter and angry and resentful is this belief that I deserve that more than they do, right? I, I'm, I'm more worthy. I'm more deserving. I don't, I don't know why they got the promotion. I don't know why they, their life seems to be turning out better than mine. I deserve that. Right? Because again, it stems from this belief that I am the center of the universe. I am the greatest. I am awesome. I deserve everything. I certainly deserve it better than them. Right? This is bitter jealousy and then selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is the belief that I am owed that. Right? I, I am owed it. And so whatever the cost, whatever it takes, I will step over whoever I need to step over. I will mow through whoever I need to mow through. Whatever it takes, everyone around me is here to serve me, right? To fulfill my needs and my happiness. And so whatever it takes, I'm going to get mine. 
that I'm going to be happy. I'm going to get what I want and what I deserve. I am owed that. So this is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. I deserve that. I am owed that. And it stems from this root belief that we all hold that I am the center of the universe. Everyone revolves around me. Right? Everyone. Everyone from our spouse all the way down to the waiter at the restaurant. Right? They're here to serve me and make me happy, whatever the cost. And, and this is the wisdom of the world. Right? This is the wisdom, or, or if you want to replace the word wisdom with perspective, if that, if that helps you understand it better, this is the wisdom. This is the perspective that the world operates in. Believing that you are the center of the universe is the right way to live. Right? This is the right way. To, if you want to get what you deserve, if you want to get what you uh, are owed, you have to believe that you are the center of the universe. And this is the right way to live. In fact, all of marketing plays into this belief. Right? All, all The entire marketing industry plays into this simple belief that we are the center of the universe. Right? So, so you deserve this product. Right? You, you deserve this service. You, you need that vacation. Right? You, you need because you deserve it. You are owed it. And if you want to be happy and fulfilled, you de- right? So all marketing, is, it plays into this belief, and we easily buy into it. Right? We lap this stuff up because we want it to be true. Right? We so desperately want it to be true that I am the center of the universe, and everybody in my life orbits me. Right? They're all here to serve me and make me happy. And if they fail in their job, they're out the door. Right? We all buy into this. This is the air that we breathe. And this is the wisdom that the world operates in. This is the perspective that the world has. That I am the center of the universe and everyone here is here to serve me. And this belief sprouts bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. But, but James tells us that this is false wisdom, that this is a false perspective. Look again what he says in verse 15, that this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. So, so James says that first off, this wisdom does not come from above. Right? This type of wisdom that the world operates in is not the wisdom that comes from God. This is not godly wisdom. And he goes on to say that this wisdom is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. So let me just quickly unpack those three for us. Number one, he says that this wisdom is earthly. It, it is earthly. It is only grounded in the here and the now. Right? It's temporal. It's momentary. And so if we are only concerned with the here and the now, if we are only concerned with immediate and temporal pleasures, then we will naturally seek what benefits us above all else. Right? So, so if all we're concerned with is this earthly wisdom that's rooted in the here and the now and the momentary pleasure, then, then we're naturally going to seek whatever makes me happy, whatever satisfies me and fulfills me in the moment. Right? That, that's all I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about anything else. Just in the moment, the, the momentary bliss, that's all I'm after. This is earthly wisdom. If there is no eternity, then, then it doesn't really matter. All that matters is the present moment and my present happiness. This is earthly wisdom. And then he says it's not just earthly, it's unspiritual. Worldly wisdom isn't concerned with spiritual realities and therefore lives as if there are no consequences. Right? So, so again, if there is no eternity, then all that matters is the here and the now, the moment, whatever makes me happy in the moment. And if there is no eternity, there are no eternal consequences. So anything goes. Right? However I want to arrange my life, however I want to operate, there, there is no lawgiver, there is no law, and there is no judge. Therefore, I have no one to answer to. Right? I have, there are no consequences to my actions. However I choose to live goes whatever it takes to make me happy in the moment. 
That this is earthly and unspiritual. And then thirdly, he says, demonic. Now, now when we hear the word demonic, we, we think of like Harry Potter or exorcist, right? Spinning heads and pea soup. Uh, but, but this is not exactly what James is talking about here. Uh, simply, th- this wisdom is not only earthly and spiritual, it is downright demonic. And what I mean by that is that this false wisdom is a lie told by the enemy to lead us down a path of destruction. So this is what James is saying, is that this type of wisdom that the world operates in, it's not just earthly and unspiritual, but it is a lie told from the enemy to lead us down a path of destruction. And the enemy is succeeding. Because this is what James goes on to say in verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So, So if we walk in this false wisdom of the world... Right? If we continue to walk in this wisdom, in this, this perspective, this way of life that says that I am the center of the universe, that everyone here is here to serve me, all that matters is my momentary happiness, whatever the cost, there are no consequences. If, if we continue to walk in this wisdom, then what ends up happening is we consume everyone around us like products. Because again, everyone around us is here to serve me. And we consume people up as commodities. And and we can only consume people for so long before there's no one left. Before there's no one left orbiting our planet. And we are a lonely planet out in the middle of the abyss, right? This, This is what inevitably ends up happening as we consume people like products. And so James says here, he gives us a stern warning that this false wisdom is leaving a destructive wake of disorder in every vile practice. Right? This wisdom that breeds bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, it, it, it brings every disorder and every vile practice. Uh, th- this is what it says in Proverbs, both Proverbs 14, 12, and again in, in chapter 16, verse 25, it says this, that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Right? That, that there is a way that seems right to us, right? There's a way of living that seems right, it sounds good, but its end is death and destruction. And this is what James is warning at here, that, right, that there's a type of wisdom that the world operates in that seems good and sensible, right? It, se- it appeals to our selfish desires, right? We, we like it, but its end is death and destruction. This is the warning James gives. Now, now James is going to go on to tell us about true wisdom. So, so he talks about false wisdom, and that's kind of a bummer, but he's going to go on to tell us about true wisdom. So look what he says in verse 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So, so this wisdom is from above, right? So where worldly false wisdom is, is earthly, temporal, it's, it's a selfish perspective, this true wisdom comes from above. It, it has eternal, heavenly God perspective, right? So, so again, like I said, that, that wisdom is simply seeing things from God's point of view, Wisdom, true godly wisdom is seeing things from God's point of view. So so when we have true wisdom, we no longer believe that we are the center of the universe because we know that God is the center of the universe, right? We we no longer, uh, everyone is no longer here to serve me. I am here to serve God, right? So so true wisdom begins to reorient our lives to, to where we are no longer the center. God is. Where, where everyone doesn't revolve around us, we revolve around God. It is seeing things as God intends them to be. And, and ultimately, the world will tell you that this is foolishness. That this is a foolish way to live. Because again, the wisdom of the world is you are the center of the universe. You are the most important person there is. Whatever it takes to make you happy, go for it. Right? And so the world will tell you that, that reorienting your lives to center not around yourself, but around God is foolishness, right? Get, get all you can while the getting is good, right? Get, whatever it takes, get yours, right? This is, this is the wisdom of the world, and they will say that this is 
foolishness. But, but this is what the Bible says. I don't have this on the screen, but 1 Corinthians 3.19 tells us that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Right? So, so the, the world will say that, that true wisdom is foolishness, but God says that the wisdom of the world is foolishness. And, and, and so false wisdom, James tells us, manifest with bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. But what about true wisdom? What, what does true wisdom bring us? Well, uh, he, he lists off several things. I don't have a lot of time. But let me just go through these quickly. True wisdom is, first of all, he says, pure. That, that with true wisdom, there is no impure, selfish desires. Right? It's pure. Uh, he says, true wisdom is peaceable. Uh, in other words, it's not in constant strife. Right, so, so again, where false wisdom, it breeds this bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. True wisdom is peaceable. It's not in constant strife with one another. We're not in competition with one another. True wisdom, he says, is gentle. Right? It's kind and not harsh. Again, because, because not, everyone's not there to serve you. Uh, right? you, you. You are there to serve others and to serve God alone. Right? So, so true wisdom is gentle. It's kind. Uh, he says true wisdom is open to reason. Right? This seems pretty obvious, but true wisdom is it's not stubborn or hard-headed. Right? When, when we have true wisdom, we, we, are, we are not stubborn and hard-headed. We're open to reason. We're, we're willing to, to uh, admit that we were wrong when we are wrong. Uh, true wisdom, he says, is full of mercy and good fruits. In, in other words, true wisdom, you, you will be alive and growing. You're going to be full of mercy and good fruits. You're going to be alive and growing. Uh, he says, true wisdom is impartial. Uh, in other words, it doesn't show favoritism. And we talked about this just a few weeks ago. He spent a good chunk on partiality, right? That we don't show favoritism towards people for any reason based on how much money they make, based upon what race they are. But we don't show partiality. And true wisdom uh, lines us up with that reality that, that we don't show partiality. True wisdom is impartial. And then he says, true wisdom is sincere. In other words, it doesn't have ulterior motives. Right? True, true wisdom, it's sincere. It doesn't have ulterior motives. Because again, false wisdom has ulterior motives. We're, we're ultimately after what benefits us. Right? Often, even when we're uh, trying to be uh, charitable or trying to serve others, often we have an ulterior motive about it. But true wisdom is sincere. And, and then finally, he tells us, he makes an interesting statement. He says that true wisdom produces a harvest of righteousness, which, which this is great news because if we want to produce a harvest of righteousness in our lives, which I hope we do, right, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, I hope that we desire to produce a harvest of righteousness. And James tells us that truism produces a harvest of righteousness. So, so ultimately, how, the question then is how do we begin to walk in wisdom, right? If we don't want to walk in this false wisdom of the world, but we want to walk in the wisdom that God has for us, right? We, we don't want the perspective of the world, but we want the perspective of God. How, how do we begin to walk in this? Well, well, I want to circle back again to verse 13. Look at what James says again, verse 13. He started this section out by saying, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. I think that word meekness is very key here. I think what James is saying is that if we're going to walk in wisdom, we need meekness or humility. Because we need meekness. We need humility to acknowledge that God is the center of the universe, not me. Right? We need humility to acknowledge that God knows best. We need humility to see things from God's perspective. And ultimately, we need humility and meekness to surrender to his wisdom, to surrender to his point of view. Right? It's going to take meekness and humility. This is what Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if we want to begin to walk in wisdom, we need the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord isn't a terror. We're not afraid of him as if he's a tyrant. But fear simply means awe, respect, and surrender. 
Right? We, we can't begin to walk in wisdom until we fear the Lord, until we have an awe and a respect and a surrender to Him as the Creator of all things. And when we begin to surrender to His point of view and we acknowledge that He is the center of the universe, that He is the Creator of all things, then we, we, we can acknowledge and just rest in the truth that He knows what He's doing. Right? That when God says this is a path of destruction, he might know what he's talking about if he created all things. Right? And so when we begin to surrender to God and we acknowledge you are the center of the universe, that life revolves not around me but around you, and that ultimately my joy and fulfillment and happiness is going to be found in you and you alone, then we can begin to surrender to that reality, to that perspective, and it begins to set us free. Because if we walk in the wisdom of this world, this idea that we are the center of the universe and everyone around me is here to serve me, not only will we end up just consuming everyone around us, but we end up stressing ourselves out because things will inevitably not go our way and, and, it, and it makes us depressed, it makes us frustrated and angry, and it leads us down this path of destruction, of frustration and anger and bitterness and so this is why God is inviting us to walk in true wisdom, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation into liberty and freedom and ultimate happiness and satisfaction and joy. Right? This is what God's inviting us into. Walk not in the wisdom of this world that's a path of destruction, but walk in the wisdom that I have that's going to ultimately lead you down a path of greater life and joy. This is the wisdom that God has for us. And if we want to walk in this wisdom, we have to surrender to God. We have to surrender to God as the center of the universe. And, and then lastly, I'll just leave you with this. Do we have to pray for wisdom? If you remember back in chapter 1, James tells us to ask for wisdom, and God will generously give. Like If we ask for wisdom, God's not going to withhold that from us. I, I, there are certain prayers that I believe God is just guaranteed to answer. Right? And I think wisdom is one of those prayers. Like if we ask God for wisdom, I don't think he's going to withhold that from us. He desires, he's generous, he wants to give that to us. And so if we begin to ask God for greater wisdom, for his perspective, and we surrender to him, I think we're going to begin to flourish, flourish in this, in this wisdom that God has for us. So let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you that you are the center of all things, that I am not the center of the universe, you are. And I pray that I would surrender more and more. I pray for each one of us that we would surrender to you, that we would step off the throne and we would let you take reign and control in our lives. God, we want your wisdom. We don't want to walk in the wisdom of this world we want to walk in your wisdom. We want your perspective. We want your truth. We want your sight. So let us see things the way that you see them. Let us orient our lives and our hearts around you, around your point of view. It's in your name we pray. Amen.